Hey everyone, uh, I'm Justin. Steve, how you guys doing? We're, we're excited to be here um, and pretty impressed that, that this many people came out for uh, a, an event like this. I think we're, we're just genuinely really excited to be here. We just kind of wanted to start by saying thanks. I think today we're going to talk a little bit about our design studio. Both Justin and I function as designers with the National Forest and we also function as fine artists outside of the studio. So we'll talk a little bit about how the two of those work hand in hand with each other. And hopefully I think above, above even beyond that, we'll, we'll, we'll inspire you guys and possibly blow your mind a little bit. <laughs> so I think we can just jump right yeah. in, right? Yep. So um, you guys can see this stuff. I, I guess all the lights are off and everything, right? Cool. So let's see, how does this work? So National Forest, we have a design studio here in Los Angeles. Um, it's, where, it's where we work, and then we have people that uh, collaborate with us. It's in Atwater Village. Uh, we work in a lot of kind of fashion, uh, action sports, fun, try to keep it very positive, uh, fun projects. So we're going to kind of walk you through the studio walk you through what we make as artists. First, we're going to walk you through who we kind of are, because we think that's an important part of the work we do. And then kind of take you through what we do as the studio, what we do as artists, and then we're going to kind of talk about how we've kind of like, what we kind of want to share most is how we've kind of managed to steer the ship of our careers a little bit and kind of get the projects that we want to be working on. So these first couple of slides, we're just going to put you guys on blast and just give you a short introduction of uh, who we are as individuals. <coughs> from, we're from California, born and raised in Southern California. Um, we thought that this was a pretty good representation of how California feels to us on the daily. Again, we're just gonna we're gonna roll right through this stuff. We're gonna just blast blast you guys. We're gonna blast you guys out of the water, man. <coughs> so Los Angeles, all the things that we love about Los Angeles, um, from from the the temperature to um, its car culture down below. That's, those are some photos of us. Surfing, even some of the um, inspirational kind of inner city stuff that happens. Uh, here's a quick photo of me uh, driving along. Opening a sunroof with snow on the top, which he didn't realize the consequence. <laughs> this is Justin on a smoke break. <laughs> uh, here's a couple photos of the studio just out and about having fun at a, at a Dodger game. We got a big gorilla for a party that we had that we had on the roof. We were pretty excited about that. That's our studio on the top left. Um, one of the things that we enjoy doing in California is driving clear down to the bottom and going to Scorpion Bay to take these surf trips with friends and with each other. There's me hanging tan on a wave <laughs> in Scorpion Bay. Um, and I think um, taking these types of trips or taking the time out to get out in the water, it's also just inspiring seeing the colors and just kind of you know, getting out of the studio to just become inspired by even these simple everyday occurrences. This is um, us up at, uh, is it Mammoth? It's Mammoth, yeah. And so we thought it would be kind of fun to put together a top 10. We're going to just kind of roll through this stuff. Um, again, we're just giving you guys a really quick introduction as to who we are as individuals. We think it's important because a, a lot of what we do within the studio is bring in these kind of personal favorites, and it somehow kind of makes its way in, into our work. So this is, yeah, this is like top 10 things we're into right now. Right. So these are some reggae seven inches. I have a personal reggae seven inch collection that I've been collecting since I was uh, maybe 18 or so. I just love the really like tactile qualities of um, reggae. Here's a, my favorite song. This is my favorite seven inch. Right here, I'll just kind of blow you guys away with it for just a second. 
this is like kind of where I imagined everybody would just like last night when we were putting this presentation together, we'd all kind of get up and start dancing <laughs> together. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I love about these, these collecting these pieces is the, the album cover art and the, the illustration. Uh, we're fans of like film from like kind of like old pop, pop culture classics to more avant-garde kind of deep cuts film and there's a lot of reference or inspiration to pull colors and um, storytelling and it's just something that we kind of like are constantly on the dig for either that, that classic like John Candy movie that we kind of learned a sense of humor from or these kind of artistic older films that um, kind of fill, fill us with bizarre creativity. The title of this film is Holy Mountain. If you guys are interested in checking it out specifically, the, the colors and the cinematography is really amazing if you're not familiar. And then with that, we try to, you know, make a, make a little an attempt at making some of our own. So we've been into making short projects, little <laughs> film projects as art pieces and documentation. Um, again, skate, skateboarding is something that we've both been into over the course of our entire lives and um, every great once in a while the skateboarding and that kind of passion makes it, its way in, back into our work in these smaller projects. This is a uh, small series that I designed and, um, and custom shaped for element skateboards. Uh, I've been really into like these older stereos. Uh, I kind of realized that I'd, in going to school and stuff, I'd end up with just like computer monitor speakers and uh, wasn't quite doing it for the music in my home. So I was like having a clean slate. I was like, well, what stereo do I want? And I started to dig and was kind of turned off by like, what's it like Best Buy or Fry's, just these stacks of modern, just kind of like crap. So I've been, so I put this project together of just building like the, the shit 70s stereo. So this is, I kind of wanted to be that guy, like how proud he is, you know? And like, they're pretty amazing because they're like heavy and just like, uh, just so much power. It's just like, it was like right along times with like big cars and just power. So, so the next slide is like the one I pieced together, but it was like a project in of itself. Like everything was a weird, uh, Craigslist trip to somewhere in LA that I'd heard of, but haven't been to. And, uh, Another thing I'm really into is popcorn. We had this like popcorn club. Um, it's kind of fun and cozy. Uh, we'll we'll watch movies like in the summer. It's kind of bad, but we'll like we'll pump the AC and then um, we'll uh, I'll go on YouTube and look up like the sounds of rain and play like the rain sounds in the house and watch movies and eat popcorn, cozy up under a blanket. <laughs> and then like deep cuts is Brewers East. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's like it's on some hippie stuff, but. Uh, Put on top of your popcorn, it's really good. <laughs> We're really into uh, so like global consciousness and um, kind of the noosphere, which is kind of this idea of like uh, <laughs> of the We're internet of the of internet one. being uh, um, the internet being a physical manifestation of like the global consciousness that exists between like living beings, and that like our our um, intuition as human beings is to recreate nature and the internet actually is this community that we already have like subconsciously through like empathy and caring but it's this uh, this network that we've created for communication so it's something that we kind of talk about and think about um, we've always enjoyed the t-shirt as this uh, really basic medium to speak and breathe creativity into we think it's just one of these very accessible um, pieces that op often gets overlooked because of um, just the advancements of technology. It's, it's just a personal favorite. And I think last on the list is drawing. Drawing is something that, something that we've always been interested in as well. It's something that is just, I think, through its um, simple accessibility, um, just having a really basic pen, pen and a pencil um, uh, available at all, all times is gives you kind of the ability to create that initial spark or that initial bit of in, um, inspiration that can eventually manifest into new projects and eventually become something greater and bigger than just a simple drawing and we'll kind of speak a little bit about that later on within the slides. These are just some sketchbooks. Um, I found that it's that I work best with just kind of hiding sketchbooks all over the house and the studio because I can't just keep one book. It's, it's best to have a bunch of them just to be able to write down notes at, 
at um, just that fleeting moment. So now we're just going to talk a little bit about National Forest, the studio. Here's a photo of the core members of National Forest. Um, we're about a, a six to eight team core of, of guys that work up in uh, the Atwater Village. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's right up just uh, north of the five freeway. Here's a shot of the interior of the space. We like this kind of, we like the, just the idea of this creating a big creative open space similar to this room where we can just speak cre creatively and freely and throw ideas around the room at ease. And here we see just some additional shots. These, these are some skateboards that we've designed and collected over the years that we have in the studio. And then the lower shot is um, another just view of the studio space. And a uh, most recent client list, some that you may and may not be familiar with. And then along with National Forest, both Justin and I, like we were saying, are uh, artists independently outside of the studio. We both work as kind of creative entities and minds outside of the, the National Forest, some of, of the studio. Here's a really dorky quick shot of me that I took of a of a, of a recent feature that I was in, and then shot of Justin. Um, and, then, and then we have a space just that's connected to National Forest, and it's kind of, we refer to it as the brain, and it's this experimental kind of creative lab that, that sits right next to the studio, and it's a space that we can kind of freely just create intuitively within. And oftentimes, the work that we create within this space makes its way back into our design work. And, Vice versa. So here are some shots of an of a art show that I was working on for, um, for, for the Beams Gallery in Tokyo. It was to benefit um, tsunami victims. That just happened recently. And some additional shots of that space. And then here's some clients that we've had the pleasure of working with um, over the last several years. More, more in relationship to our artwork that we make. And so you kind of might ask, why, why do we separate the two? Why do we separate the artwork from the design work? And so we've put together this really just brief uh, list. And I think it's because the design work we've found over the years will get us certain projects and It'll allow us to work on certain things that, that we very much enjoy that our art will, artwork will not let us work on. And it, it works vice versa. Our artwork allows us to work and collaborate on projects with individuals that we wouldn't typically work on with our design work. So within the design agency, <coughs> we very much enjoy this small list. We, we enjoy the art direction, the brand identity, the collaboration with the team, and the concept of building brands and building campaigns and working on very large scales. And then with the artwork, we're, we're very much interested in this idea of visual exploration outside of client-based work. We think that it kind of breaks the monotony, the everyday monotony that you might find yourself within um, on only working on commercial-based projects. And then we also like the idea of the gallery building creative experiences and also having a personal outlet and the opportunity to speak purely, to speak without or without being inhibited by any sort of outside client views. And, and we very much enjoy the idea of um, the creative contribution to the greater. We feel like without just jumping into these personal projects, some of the people who we admire out in the world wouldn't, just simply wouldn't exist. Like the Hemingways of the world, all these people that just kind of act and have made work over the years just wouldn't exist if they solely uh, were making work for clients. So now we're going to, so we'll click through some examples of like back and forth artwork, design work. And, like, and the way we like to, to look at it and the way we talk about it within the studio is that really we're just trying to pump out this one vision or this one view. And it's, it's really, it's kind of about like sincerity and being positive and having an optimistic view of the times and um, where the world is. And, and like Steve was saying, Sometimes that's through client work, which has its benefits of these clients have these like big scale, like this work is gonna go 
you know, global or it's going to go, it's going to be a national presentation of the work. But with that, there's some dilution between like collaborating with the client's view and what we want to do. And we really try to encourage clients to kind of work our vision in and we kind of convince them that that's why they asked us to work on it in the first place. But then the art making is, has a smaller reach, but it's a more potent, concentrated uh, representation of the thinking. So we're just going to kind of click through uh, some examples. This is a collection that we did with uh, Quicksilver for their <coughs> Quicksilver Limited menswear. Um, tried to really inject a concept into this line. We helped work on the, the, the cut and sew and the, the materials and kind of took the collection and then helped uh, brand it and, and present it. Again, these, were, these are some shots of that show that I had out in Beams this May of last year. Um, this is a, we, we kind of juxtaposed these client projects with these art projects. So this is an example, another example of an art project, recent art project. We worked for a few years with Urban Outfitters, uh, doing, doing their catalogs, uh, helping present the brand. This is a, a quick look at some of the covers that we did. Some branding marks that we've done through the studio, it's another thing we enjoy, kind of the, the one word poem, uh, either helping kind of update a, a mark or um, creating a mark from scratch. Uh, there's this music festival called Bonnaroo that we help uh, every year. It's, their, um, it's, it's uh, in Tennessee. It's a really big festival. It's a few days long. But we help, every year we help uh, brand the experience of the, the festival and help all of their uh, messaging, so their tickets and their posters. Some snowboards that we did for DC. Um, again, just kind of putting some some com concepts into, injecting concepts into a product line. We really like working on like skateboards and uh, snowboards because it's fun to make something that someone's going to be really proud of while they're doing what they enjoy. So it's like, add, it's like that's like, like for people who really like snowboarding, that's their shit, and then they have this thing that they want to rep, so it's important to us. Um, some artwork that we're making in the studio. Um, some skateboards. It was pretty exciting. I think as a, there's these funny moments that we realize when we're kids, like it's exciting seeing a wall of skateboards, or it's exciting, like, uh, I don't know. So there was a, it was a big moment to roll into a store and just see a line of boards that we had done. The other one was like raiding the warehouse, like sticking your hand to a big box of wheels. <laughs> it was like a, that's it was like, like closest, weird. <laughs> our closest to ever be, ha, being sponsored. You know, I think every kid that skateboards yeah. grows up with that dream of one day like fucking around in the in like the skate warehouse. You know, doing stuff that you're not supposed to. So this was a great opportunity to make our way to that warehouse and you know scoop up a bunch of boards. Uh, campaign that we did for kids. Um, we had just recently the pleasure of working with Aaron Rose, who you may be familiar with in town. He puts together this workshop named the Make Something Workshop, and he started out, I think, working with Nike initially in New York, and they brought in a, a bunch of artists who we've always admired, kind of the Mike Millses and Causes and stuff like that. So recently he... Um, he brought that to Los Angeles and asked me to be a part of a workshop to uh, educate these underprivileged um, high school students on how to screen print. And just recently we had the pleasure of working with Roxy and helping to rebrand the, the Roxy wordmark and creating, these, um, creating a device or system to be implemented um, corporate-wide for uh, for the um, 2011 to 2013 kind of Roxy look. Speed up a little bit. Uh, just recently I released, a, a, this is a personal piece, a porcelain sculpture um, for that just came out. And here we see just an entire range of stuff. Another, another kind of quick look at the, the product that we like when people are doing what they enjoy. It's nice to have like, to kind of enhance that with graphics they're stoked on. So all this work is kind of just meant to give you an idea or a feel for what we've been up to recently and how the, how the personal artwork uh, exists with the more corporate client work. And so this next section um, is kind of our inspirational section, hopefully. And we just want to talk about the spark, the idea of that first initial vulnerable 
um, stage of creating a concept for a project and how when harnessed properly it can kind of manifest and turn into a much bigger, greater idea. So one thing that we kind of learned kind of intuitively, intuitively, but we think it's an important thing that we like to share, is that when we, when we finished school, we were like, we were just making work that we really liked, or just about subject matter that we really liked. And um, you kind of put that out into the world, and then from that, what seemed like coincidentally, but in hindsight is actually like kind of, seems like this no-brainer, that's who started calling us to get jobs. So we realized there's this formula, if you like, we love skating and snowboarding, so we make images that are in that world, and that's who calls us, is skating and snowboarding clients. And really, in, in even more hindsight, we realized who more perfect to work for them because that company as an entity raised us, teaching us what the culture is about. Then we kind of like grew up a little bit and now we're making images. So they spent all these years teaching us and now we're helping push them. So it's like, we really, in this we want to kind of talk about how we're constantly trying to like spark these ideas and just put them out into the world. And then inevitably, now we have this funny confidence that we'll, we'll just make this stuff and that person's going to call us to help them do it for them. And then that's how we're talking about there's this singular, there's this similar vision that we're putting out and sometimes we do it on our own and sometimes we do it through clients. Right. So what we want to do is take this very cliche concept or metaphor and use a, a literal spark as a metaphor for the creative spark. So take a Take the very simple idea of a spark and potentially what a spark can give you. Uh, uh, the, the first initial spark can give you a, a flame, which a flame can give you light and can, can help you to read by your book and, and whatnot. But a spark can also create a fire, something that brings community when you're camping, something that brings warmth. And it's something that it can also create a spark to spark, spark up spark plug that we're all familiar with. It can bring us here today. We think it's important too to note that a spark is this very vulnerable, it's this very vulnerable state. And kind of when gone out of control, a spark can create a wildfire and burn down an entire forest. Or it can spin turbines and bring electricity to this room and all across the, the city or around the world. And it can also create um, and cook the food that we eat, which is a very fun thing. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Presentation over. <laughs> so now, now with that in mind, let's just kind of look at the National Forest Spark, and we've got several examples of how these very um, vulnerable ideas have kind of turned into bigger projects for us. Example A, Art Center. Both Justin and I met at the Art Center in Pasadena here, California, while studying, uh, we were studying illustration. We literally did not know what we wanted to do. We both went into school thinking that we were going to draw naked ladies for the rest of our life or something <laughs> like that. We were taking a bunch of um, life drawing classes, which I'm sure some of you in this room are familiar with. Which is funny, but it's such an intuitive thing to like go to school. Right. It was like this weird intuitive thing. Like, it was what we had to do. Yeah, that in itself like, is kind of, a, of this. This weird spark. Yeah. So here's, we're going to kind of take it back and get a little bit embarrassing for you guys, but this is us back in college kind of roaming around the, the, the halls. Um, we created this little note down here in the lower, lower right corner. This is kind of our first spark in this first example. While in school, Justin and I met and near the end of, of college, we um, came together within this independent study course and created and illustrated this, um, this travel magazine. It was something that we just kind of pulled out of nowhere. Hey, it would be great. Let's just come up with this fictional travel magazine. You know, we weren't getting paid for this project. As, as a matter of fact, we were paying way too much money to come up with this idea to give, call, give the school this like, cool travel magazine idea. So I think the, intu the spark of the intuition, too, was that we were making uh, these art images. And when you're in school, you make a bunch of art images, and you just put them under your bed. And it was just kind of like, they didn't have any context. Then we realized that like, oh, if you take this image and you put it on a skateboard, the context really like 
helps the, the image. But then we didn't know how to make design work, so we crashed this uh, editorial design class where we want to add, we just want to put our images in an editorial spread because we thought we were going to do editorial illustration when we finished school, which was this funny, like, intuitive spark, but then um, that led to, like, these bigger things. So then we finished school, and we had put those things on our website as though they were, like, these real magazines, like these surf mags. And then Urban Outfitters hit us up to come out and meet with them because they, really, they had seen the magazine that we liked, and they really, they really wanted us to work with them. And uh, there's this funny dynamic of the art directors wanting to feel cool enough that they'd actually seen the magazine, which didn't exist, and we knew it didn't exist. It was, like, literally on foam core under our bed. But then they haven't wanted to present that to the marketing, and we were there, and it's like, we just, you know, we flew out there and took the initiative, like, yeah, we can do this. Like, right. look what we've done before. Which really did make that, <laughs> we really did make that work. It was real work. It just wasn't real, real work. Yeah, it was interesting. We, we fly all the way out to Philadelphia to present these mood boards to the CEOs of Urban, out, of Urban Outfitters. And, I mean, we were like 22, 23 at the time, had just graduated from college. Somebody had seen that last kind of travel magazine stuff, a, a younger designer presented it to the higher-ups, and next thing we know, we're out there presenting to, like, these big CEOs and board members of Urban, and we get done presenting, and it seemed like it was pretty slam dunk, you know? We're just kind of talking to them like we're talking in this room. It was a lot of dudes and totalies and stuff. And we get done <laughs> presenting, and it, it went, we feel like it went pretty well, and at the end of the conversation, they turn around and ask us, so this sounds really great. You guys look pretty young. Have you guys ever put together any printed pieces or magazines before? And uh, I looked at Justin, when Justin's a lot better at lying than I am, and I look over <laughs> at, at Justin, and he just looks at them and just like straight in the eye and is like, yeah, of course we have. <laughs> I, mean, was, I don't think, it, for the record, I don't think it was lying. I think it was more like, Flat can, out can you guys do this? And it's like, oh, yeah, of course. I don't know. No, I mean, <laughs> All right. I don't think it was a lie. It was a lie. <laughs> no, but it was a good lie. And I mean, look at where, I mean, we ended up, so we ended up presenting and working on one catalog. They gave us one piece to work on. And it, yeah, it, ex it exploded into like three and a half years of traveling the world and like going on these photo shoots and just turning these things around. We learned, it was like a big learning lesson for us, which was great because this funny, these funny little things led to this thing that we didn't, we didn't know art direction on this level existed and we didn't know what it meant to work with photographers and kind of like concept uh, a book and put it together. And in school there was a lot of um, discussion about how, you know, you look at something like, man, this sucks. Why is this so bad? Like looking at printed work. And then in this project we just learned that lesson that we know very well now that it's not how well you can do it, it's how well you can do it within the constraints, which is just time and like budgets and opinions. Um, but I think we were just so caveman and naive about it that we were just, we were just uh, adamant about pumping our ideas into it and getting this company. And before you know it, we were like steering this big company. Because this stuff would come out before any other printed collateral for the brand. So this was setting the tone for each season. Right. We, designed, we were designing seven catalogs. The first catalog eventually turned into designing seven catalogs a year. And over the course of three years, we designed roughly 28 to 30 catalogs. So you could kind of see how that small, just kind of tiny little surf magazine that we were doing in college turned into this much bigger idea. So jumping into the example two, we're going to kind of just blast away. We realized I'm looking at the time here, but we're going to make, try and make it. We have three examples, so yeah. this is two of three. So this is number two. Like, like I was saying earlier, one of the things that I've always enjoyed um, outside of creative, of the studio work is drawing. Just this very simple act of putting a mark down on a piece of paper I feel is extremely exciting. I think that one of the reasons why it is so exciting is because half the time that I'm drawing, I have literally no clue what I'm doing. And I think that that's a, a, it's an extremely exciting place to be in. I feel like when you don't know what you're doing, when you're creating, it means that you're kind of within this space of invention. And I think that in living within that space of invention, it, you know, those things that you can invent, it's the potential of them can eventually turn into uh, endless amounts of possibilities. So these are the, some just drawings that I've been creating over the years um, in various sketchbooks. Like I was saying, some of them have a context and a story, and some of them are literally just jibber-jabber. It's kind of almost, um, I think, that point of the day when I sit down to draw often, it's like creative writing, where it's like just free association. You're just drawing anything. And sometimes th those drawings turn into projects and eventually end up turning into screen prints, and sometimes they don't. 
but it's just that simple act of drawing that I really enjoy and always find myself coming back around to. So every great now and then, like I was saying, the drawings will turn into these projects. And in town here, we have a friend that works at Stone's Throw. He has this party on Sundays. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, familiar with it. It's in Hollywood. It's called the Do-Over. And the entire party is, um, kind of revolves around sangria and getting completely ripped on sangria on Sundays and <laughs> enjoying the DJs there. So he wanted to put out this 10 inch. And so I created these wacky little characters and drawings um, based on the sangria. And, um, and we put out this 10 inch, the 10 inch was a hit. And uh, he, here's some interiors of the 10 inch. I kind of like, again, you can kind of see like the the, my interest within that reggae music and the drawing kind of working its way into this project. I created this kind of interactive piece so that the, the owner of the record could recreate or remix the cover. And then we went out and had this big party at the do-over, celebrated, put the stuff out. And next thing I know, our friend over at um, um, Target calls up and is like, yo man, I saw your do-over stuff. We've basically got a really big do-over in Los Angeles and it's called the 53rd uh, Grammys. The, there was the Grammys in town here. That was like, it was a year ago. And so Target wanted to work on a project. They had seen the work and it turned into this really massive billboard piece. So um, working hand in hand with National Forest and uh, these kind of just this wacky world of, um, of these drawings that I've created over the years, we created, we built this really big world celebrating Target and the Grammys and music. And, uh, and also, yeah, California, Los Angeles. So we tur they turned into these big vertical panels that were just outside of, they were installed just outside of the um, LA Live Center. Here, here's a couple shots of seeing the stuff installed. It's interesting, I feel like that, there's that constant um, dialogue of print, print is dead, you know, but I don't know, I showed up and saw these things printed and it was just really exciting. I'd never seen any of our work printed this large before. Here's a couple of night shots. So again, that's, a, that's an example of how quickly those drawings can kind of turn into this much bigger idea. Jumping into this, um, this third example, our last example of the day. Um, again, we're, we're going to kind of show now how that creative spark can kind of make its way from these really intuitive marks and paintings, and it can work into um, collaborative projects, and then all the way and, and jump and manifest all the way outside of that into even greater things. So again, one of the things that we enjoy is painting. This was a skateboard that I hand painted for a show um, in Minnesota it was all the proceeds were to go to build this skate park in Minnesota. The name of the show was Skate or Die. And the show was a success. They built the skate park and everything was cool. And immediately after the show had happened and, and they toured the show, we got a call from uh, Burton and it was Ann Floor, Ann Floor Marks, which is uh, one of the writers for the Burton team. And she really loved the artwork and essentially just wanted the, the artwork recontextualized onto her snowboard series. So it was really fun just working with the writers there and refiguring out how to build this world and, and further kind of push it for the this, for this snowboard. And then those snowboards turned into another couple calls from Burton uh, to design a much larger ranges. We designed several series for Burton over the last couple of years. And the boards even turned into hardware for Burton. So they quickly, you know, that small skateboard quickly turned in from one kind of signature artist series to a series of boards and bindings for Burton and eventually turned into us art directing an entire seasonal campaign. The, the name of the campaign was the Live What You Love campaign for Burton. And the idea was to showcase the on the mountain and off the mountain experience of, um, of snowboarding, which Justin and I are extremely familiar yeah. with. Yeah, like we're, we're big fans of this stuff where like the, the act is more than just doing it. It's really like the fun of like being up there and hanging out with friends, the community. So every image kind of had like either a big banger action shot and then like people goofing off in all those shreds. But it's, it's, I think this is a good example of like a very intuitive mark and then a, of that skateboard to a um, literal translation of snowboards, which is kind of this no-brainer. And then this, it blew up into this campaign. And now that that relationship's there, 
it, it, we followed the relationship to when the people from Burton left Burton, they're now at Puma, so now it's, we're doing a lot of uh, bigger projects with Puma. Right, so we gained this relationship with the art director at Burton, and, he, and, and we worked very well with him creatively, and he left Burton, made his way over to creative director of Puma, and we shortly after the, I think a, a couple months or a year after the Live What You Love campaign, we received a call from Puma to, a, to ask us to help um, art direct the Games We Play campaign. So this is another example of things getting really big really fast. Uh, we built this uh, massive set. It was like a 60-foot set. Um, these doors open, and uh, we filmed these commercials and uh, uh, photographed the campaign with, uh, with Jared Eberhardt, who's an amazing director, and uh, John Johnson, this great photographer. And it was just this big collaborative thing. We wanted the idea that like, all of the fun from the athletics of Puma comes from the word mark. And uh, it, it all wrapped up into this campaign where it was... Uh, the campaign was called The Games We Play, but the idea of the campaign was that it was an avant-garde theater troupe that kind of like did these plays. So the play was about playing. It was all about kind of putting the fun back into sports. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea, the simple idea that we tried to convey with it was just to bring the joy back into sports. I think that um, within, within sports and sportswear and sports companies, there's um, brands that convey different various ideas and. Puba just got to a point where they just wanted to talk about the fun within sports, not necessarily the competitive nature of sports, but the fun. Whereas maybe um, some of their direct com competitors, like a Nike, is they're, they're more interested in talking about the competitive aspects, that kind of like moment before you score the touchdown. Puba was more was was extremely excited and is extremely excited to talk about, you know, just the camaraderie and the the youthfulness and the, the fun spirit that, that sports can bring to your life. But I think, as, I mean, as we wrap up these last few slides, I think the biggest lesson, not lesson, because we're not teachers, but like, the thing we want to share the most is that like, what we really like are the, is the, that super vulnerable moment of sharing something that you sincerely enjoy. Or, and it's the more vulnerable you are and the more true to what you like, the more likely someone else can actually like, emotionally attach to it. Um, and then, so, so we just, the idea is just put that out there, and then um, with the, with the, if it's relevant, which hopefully it is, um, that's, that's kind of how you can steer your career. It's like you're putting out the stuff that you sincerely like, people will relate to it, and then that's, and that's where um, your, your working path will go. And that's what we've tried to do with the work that we do and what we wanted to talk about. Thank you. I think, I mean, to be, just to be blunt, I think to be, or to be honest, we're still figuring it out. You know, it's, it's one of those um, questions that we're constantly asking each other. And I, I think also having um, friends and peers that, that were graduating at the same time or that were involved with um, design, it was easy to kind of pick up the phone and say, Yo, man, we got this big project in. What should we charge for it? What does your studio charge for it? And yeah. it's somebody that's, you know, working for a studio that we're kind of aspiring to, to eventually be at. The, the question is, how do we know, evaluate our value and budgeting? And I, I think a, one thing that we kind of are fans of is that, like, the faux pas of asking people what they get paid benefits the clients but not the designers. When really it's like, we have a network where we can reach out to people, but... There's this like little bit of culture inserted that that's rude to ask, but really, it's not. I don't think it is. I think so. We so we just kind of lean on our network, and then, like Steve was saying, we don't. We're still figuring it out. I think we kind of look at things annually versus project-wise, and uh, we have little fail-safes where you just bid high, but then kind of 
when they say that's too high, you kind of come back like, oh, well, we thought it was this, but maybe we'll scale it back to this, and then right. just <laughs> tricks like that. Um, I want to ask about the Target Grammy work you did. Mm -hmm. um, your illustration style, it's really great, and it's really like, imaginative, and it's almost kind of unpredictable. And you know, clients tend to really kind of like predictability sometimes when they, you know, when they hire people to come in and work. So can you talk a little bit about like what kind of feedback you get when you show work that's so like, um, it's so like uncharted, you know, it kind of mm -hmm. comes together in a really organic way and it's, it's a little bit of a surprise to everyone when it, when it comes to life? Yeah, that's interesting. I think that, um, you know, that's something that we're constantly faced with, even with the design work, it is, um, is how do we push it? How do we push ourselves within within everything that we do on the day to day. And I think for that, for that project specifically, it, it, was, um, it was definitely the case where we presented this personality that Target was requesting, and they literally hit back with the bullet point of, there can be none of X, Y, Z, and A, B, C, you know? So I think from early on within the work, we kind of, um, we kind of tried to um, analyze and figure out and get in the client's head of what, w what would have been appropriate to present within the drawings and what would have not been appropriate within the drawings, if that makes any sense. You know, kind of trying to kind of know you're the enemy, I think. <laughs> and and um, I, I don't think that that's like maybe, I don't think Target's the enemy, but you know, knowing, for, for lack of better words, knowing who the client is and knowing what's appropriate is, I think, extremely helpful in enabling you to explore and be as imaginative as you possibly can be. I think, I think if you take a step back, too, our work is so diverse that people are coming, like, we've, it's like one step back, the sparks that we're kicking off, um, sending our, our work in this kind of big, broad world, that's what people are expecting to get in a sense. So it's kind of like, we're, that's how we steer it. It's not so much steering it once you're engaged, it's like what you're presenting people to get those calls from. And then we have funny like, we have these funny like working phrases too where it's like, we'll tell clients that if they're uncomfortable with it, it's good because it's something they've never seen. Right. You know what I mean? Like we want to be new, like we're all uncomfortable with this. We have to like, this is coming out in the future, so this is like what the future will look like. It's not right now. I, I think too, with the, with like our general mantra of just kind of constantly putting things out and starting these little sparks constantly, a lot of the clients are approaching us rather than us approaching the clients. So we kind of also have that upper hand, you know, like we we can we can afford to, to or play the game of the client's calling to work on this big target project and we're so excited about it, but our response is like. Well, I don't know. We're gonna check our schedule and our calendar. Um, we'll we'll see if we can make it work. You know, just to kind of spin it so that the client kind of realizes, hey, you're we're, you're coming to us because of our certain perspective. Right. We're we're very careful with our language too. Where we'll never in, in emails and it's subtle, but we think it works. But we'll never phrase things as we're working for you or with you. It's always collaborating. Like we're happy to collaborate with you on this. Because internally, the way we look at the studio is we're going to be pumping stuff out every day, no matter what, like our own initiated projects, art projects. So when clients call, we're actually evaluating whether or not the job is worth us stopping what we're doing anyways to help them. So, so just, it's kinda, I think it's just how we engage them, that like they're literally calling us to help because they have a problem that they think we can help solve or work with them or collaborate with them. Um, so I think those subtle just like, you just kind of control how their interaction is. Because as soon as you're working for somebody, they're they're kind of, they can command you to do things, and we're not afraid to, to fire clients and leave projects and stuff. Maybe one more question. Well, on that note, how do you fire a client? Uh, it's, um, Dude, it's, dif it's the, difficult. The, I'm, I'm terrible at names. Who's the, ma who's the Mad Men, the, the head character? <laughs> Draper. Draper, it's just the Draper, man. You just roll <laughs> in and you're fired. You, you dig fired. deep. Yeah. <laughs> no. so, um, we'll have like, I think we'll just have these conversations that um, we'll talk to them that we just don't, we're, either their project isn't in line with the studio or we're not seeing eye to eye. Um, our, lots of our contracts are in phases, so we'll round out the phase and then just not accept the next project. Right. And fortunately, fortunately, we haven't, we haven't found ourselves 
it's often in the position where we're firing anyone. It's it's usually just trying to understand the project before it's kicked it's like off. Pre-fire. Yeah, understanding. Do we take this one on, or do we just kind of tell them that we're a little bit booked up this year, or what have you? Cool. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.